Welcome to Glitch Please, the show where we talk about video games every single week and all the news that's going on in the world of video games. I'm Ashley. I'm Gus. I'm Adam. Uh, so today we've got a bunch of things to talk about. We're going to be talking uh, about some of the things coming out of TGS. There have been some exciting announcements. Uh, Steam is changing the way they're doing user reviews. Uh, Nintendo has a lovely little tribute to Satoru Iwata, so we'll cover all that when we get to news. YouTube has announced some new features for gamers. Specifically, it seems like to try to recover some of the revenue a lot of gaming channels are losing to uh, the apocalypse. And also, we're going to talk about or Divinity Original Sin 2, which we've all uh, been playing. It's really not an original sin anymore, is it? It's Yeah, I was thinking about that last night. It's like just another sin at yeah. this point, right? Divin Divinity, I didn't learn my lesson. I'm sinning again. <laughs> what, if it's a, what if it's a new sin? It's an original. It's a second original. No sin. one's ever done this. Sin like before. this is a specific sin that they did the second time, and not the first. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we will be talking about all of that stuff, and this episode of Glitch Please is brought to you by Movement Watches. We will also talk to them uh, a little bit more uh, soon. But thanks very much for sponsoring this episode. I can't. We're going to talk to them a little more soon. Yeah. We'll talk to them a little Back bit. Back to more. you, MVM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's talking to you, kid. Um, but first of all, before we get into all that meaty stuff, what y'all been playing? Oh, I forgot to mention something last week that I've been playing, and I'm still playing it. Okay. On top of, of, so, um, I forgot to mention, I've been, I can't talk now. Super I've been playing uh, Everybody's Golf on PS4. Oh, how are you liking it? I love it. It's really good. I remember at E3, uh, you got to interview the Everybody's Golf team, and mm -hmm. you were super excited yeah, about it. Yeah, it's a great game. Uh, I've been playing a lot with my, my wife, actually. Uh, she's been... Uh, picking it up and we play like little multiplayer games together. Have you been playing online with uh, Greg Miller? I have not gone online yet. I'm still doing a lot of the single player stuff and the only multiplayer I do is local. Uh, is, it, is it just a, a golf game or is it like, is there like some, is it like a gimmicky golf game? There's other gimmicky stuff you can do too. Okay. Uh, I think you can go fishing. But, okay, but but is it like primarily supposed to be like a, a yeah, golf game? it's like a golf game and you okay. can just like fuck around. Like it's like a world of golf courses. Then you can like do other little stuff if you want to. But you I wonder to. why they rebranded it. Well, everybody's golf was always the Japanese name. Oh, I see. And then it would undergo localization. They would name it Hot Shots Golf. Okay. Uh, I, so they just I've been wondering the, about the brand. That, but okay. that makes a lot okay. more sense now. So. And, and uh, of course, I've also been playing PUBG still, uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, uh, Stardew Valley, and XCOM 2: <laughs> War of the Chosen. They're busy busy weeks. I'm all over the place. You play like a busy. different game every day. Dude. I play multiple games a day. God. I'm, like hopping around. Thank God I got through Mario Rabbits, otherwise I'd still be doing yeah. that one too. Yeah. And I, I need to replay Shadow of Mordor before Shadow of War comes out. Do you? I, I, that seems like a really bad idea. Replaying that game? Yeah, because because you're getting a, a like a very similar game experience after playing 40 hours of th that game. I did I did the same thing for XCOM. And you regretted it. Chosen because the game was too similar initially, I said. But then once you got through the initial part, it was fine. Okay. No, I'm Listen, you do you, ma'am. You no, know, I Yeah, I'm, what are you doing? No judgment. I see where you're going with this, Adam, though, in that I sometimes like if something's coming up, try to retread the path, but do it where there's enough time left afterwards to have a break. Right. Uh, especially like games that are very mechanically similar, like if you're gonna burn out on that mechanic after forty hours, don't spend thirty of those hours playing through the first game. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Yeah, maybe you're crazy. Leave me alone. Let me play how I want to play. You, how about that? You huh? can play how you want to. play. I got play. so many games going on. If I get tired, I go to another game. <laughs> I'm not. A, I'm like. I'm the opposite. I can't game hop at all. Pretty much. Yeah. If you go into something, you're all in. Yeah. I, I got into my first boat battle ever in PUBG the other day. Or yeah. Oh, how it was, was that? It was, it was weird. Did you win? Yeah. I what, killed everyone. What was the the most notable thing you've been playing this week? PUBG. PUBG. Great. No, but I've been playing a lot of Divinity Original Sin 2, which we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, How many hours do you think you're up to in PUBG? I'm, I'm not that far into it. I'm only like 125. That's pretty significant. I but it's not like a crazy amount. It's no, like, no, no, that's a lot, but it's not like an insane amount. Now, Bernie managed to put in 270, he's over, 270 yeah, 280 hours. And then he, And I'm still better than him for some reason. And he had the nerve to tell me I play a lot of Persona. Yeah, that's that's bullshit. You, you played less than half of that amount of time. Exactly. In, yeah. in a, in a, over a longer span, right? Yes. Yeah. I, like I started Persona in February. And yeah. plus, I'm, I'm sure you saw more than one island in Persona. You saw more than one map. I did. I saw many brains. Mm -hmm. Many inside of many, many minds. How about you, Adam? What are you going all in on this week? Uh, I've been sort of... Uh, Bouncing around for the first time in my life. No, I've been playing like uh, 
Still playing Destiny 2. I'm at a point in that game where I can't really do much else alone. I could grind more public quests and get exotics and things like that. But for the most part, I've been playing that with Grace or uh, other friends. Um, I did the Nightfall this week, and that that, that 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 game is like really fun to play with friends. Like it's such a good cooperative game. But I am like kind of hamstrung by the by that requirement now because guided games aren't really fully out yet so i can't do like the nightfall or anything or the the raid or anything yet until i have a group um but it's a great game uh i've been playing some board games i've been like exploring the solo board game realm which is like maybe the saddest thing you can do uh but at the same time <laughs> there's like, more out there than uh solitaire <laughs> there is i mean the the thing is is that i like if, if i have downtime and i'm not playing a video game and i just want to like I want to explore a board game. Like, I can't always ask Grace to be like, let's sit down for two hours and play a board game, but I can always, like, play a solo board game. And uh, so I've been doing a little bit of that. I bought Arkham Horror, the living card game, which I haven't really delved into too much. Uh, and then Divinity. And Divinity is, I need more time in that game, but that game could potentially suck away, like, 200 hours of my life. I think we should book more uh, meetings. In which Please, play let's talk, game. let's book meetings. Let's okay. talk a lot about stuff. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, I've been playing uh, more Mario Rabbids. That's a good game. Uh, yeah, I'm How far are you? really enjoying it. Not super far. I haven't put in as much time as I'd like to. Um, I'm world two. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Really, like I love it. I love like I love the weapons. I love the mechanics. I love the way they the the pacing as they introduce new characters for you, as they introduce new mechanics. They're all super charming. Mm -hmm. There's just they nailed it with that game. It's a great game. Amazing. Really um, happy about it. You know, but I don't have too much about it to say about it beyond what's been said before on this show, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it. Cool. Um, so why don't we then get into the news? All right, so TGS has been happening. That's the Tokyo Game Show, uh, which I totally wish we could all go to, but it's a little bit tough. It's kind of a, actually a business-to-business <coughs> convention for the most part, so it's unfortunately it's not like a, a PAX or something where a lot of <coughs> people go, although people do go to it anyway. TGS is a weird con, dude. It's, it's uh, a weird con. Uh, you okay? My throat is glitching. I, I went to TGS a couple years back, <coughs> and I was like very excited to go, and after going to like the PAXs and things like that, it's <coughs> such a different tone, and I kind of didn't like it. If that's, I don't know if that's. Do you wish you kept the mystique I, alive? Well, I really yes, but I also kind of like, it's it's a lot easier just to get all the news from from like sites that will tell you what's happening at TGS rather than walking around that like massive floor because it's just a big floor with lots of room and lots of people and lots of mobile games and there's not like a whole lot I was interested in doing there. So uh, did you? Were I was there that year also. Yeah. It was, uh, two years ago in 2015. And I had the same experience where. I was shocked at how business to business focused it was. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Because right. you, you hear about people going to it all the time, like enthusiasts, just gamers who are really excited about it, but then you actually get there and that's not the convention's focus. Right. It's, uh, there were a lot of like uh, economic development uh, councils from you know, various countries looking to ha help developers start development within their countries, you know, stuff like that, like more high level. I think it was also a little tough because. As a tourist to Japan, I think the TGS was the least interesting thing I could be doing in Japan at that time. So I just wanted to be in Japan doing mm -hmm. Japan stuff. Yeah, which is not to say that they don't do announcements. There is oh, a lot absolutely. of news. Um, PlayStation in particular came out with a lot of really cool announcements. <clears throat> the big one, I think, uh, uh, being a game called Left Alive. So this is a new game. It's a survival action shooter. It's set in a dark and gritty world. Uh, which should sound familiar, but it's being developed by Armored Core director uh, Toshifumi Nabeshima. Um, it's being worked on. The character designs are from uh, Metal Gear character designer Yoji Shinkawa, and the mech designs are by uh, Metal Gear and Xenoblade Chronicles developer Ataka Yuki Yana Yanase. They do so, some good mech designs in Metal Gear, dude. It's, yeah. it's, it's basically like a dream team of yeah. designers uh, right there. So I'm already just based on those names alone, super excited yeah. to see what they come up with. Also, the the art they showed, the poster, was very Metal Gear. Survival action with mechs sounds awesome. Yeah. So, yes, I'm going to try and be patient on that one and not rev my hype engines too early, but it sounds very, very cool. Um, we also got a release date for Monster Hunter World that's coming out January 26th. That's a worldwide uh, release date. I'm super excited for that game. Lots, like, of, I, lots I wanna, of people are. Why? Why because, I? because I haven't... 
I don't like playing games on my 3DS that are like third-person action games because those controls are not good, at least for me. Um, and this you is coming to the Switch. You have trouble with 3DS in general because you have big old hands. I got hands. big hands. This. Let's like look at look at my hands compared to your hands. Damn. <laughs> and this is this is trying to use the same 3DS. <laughs> I use an X like I use a 3DS XL because my hands are like I feel just like not suited to the tiny size so much. But that's that's the point is that I, I'm excited to play it on the Switch because I have. Or it's not on the Switch. It's on PC, it's, PS4. It, this is yeah. This is going to be PS4. Yeah, I'm excited to play it on PS4 because it has a real controller. Um, so that's that. And I've never got to play a Monster Hunter game and. Like based on art style and like type of game, they seem awesome. Like it's it's a game about like strategically working your way through a combat scenario and getting cool loot and building cool armor. Looks like it's going for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Yeah, Probably playing no PC Switch. then. Yeah, no Switch, which is kind of kind of fucked. And it looks like you can be a cat person. Uh, I'm in. The the I think those are your God. I don't know enough about Monster. I think those are like your your friend. There's a name for the Palicos. Yes, they're okay, like your, they're, your, they're your friends. I will think oh, of them okay. forever as Khajiit. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it does look really cool, though. I want to learn more about it. But right now, because it's a 2018 game, I'm 2018 also like is so close. I'm, dude. I, but I'm like, I've got some four time. months away. Four, four months. We're in. The, we're, we're at we're, the we're, end of September. We're approaching October. So we, October, November, December, December and then that's end three of months. January. And then January. January. Okay. At the end, it's January that's, 26th. That's not that long. You're four months away. What was four months ago? E3. That's. Oh God! Was E3 four months ago? Yeah, May twenty first. I was E3 was just under four months ago. Oh my God! So it's, you got like about that, you got about that much it. time to wait, and then you got Monster Hunter. Not so, bad. Not then you're in twenty eighteen. Yeah. Not bad. Uh, we also got a trailer for the Shadow of the Colossus remake. Don't know if you checked that. I have out, not seen that looks, one yet. It looks radical, so highly recommend it. We will uh, put it in the link dump for everyone to check out uh, if you haven't seen it. Uh, Final Fantasy IX. Got a surprise uh, announcement for PS4, and it was one of those nice mic drop moments of like, oh yeah, and it's out today. So it's been, you know, they've already released it on on PC. So and, this is just a uh, release. This isn't like a remake, obviously. It's not a remake. It's it's the remaster like you the got. Opposite. Yeah, on so they've done it for PC as right already as well, but. Now PS4, that's nice. Okay. I loved Final Fantasy IX. It was a good one. I, overshadowed by seven and eight for sure, though. I would agree. I would say that seven was more of uh, like a wow factor because it had never been done before. Mm -hmm. By the time nine came around, it had, so it doesn't blow you away quite as much. But I think it was probably technically superior. Mm. I'll, I'll go with that. I think I liked nine more than seven. Also, the story was wonderful. Yeah, I really love Nine. So it's out. It looks like it's uh, going to be twenty-one dollars, but until September twenty-sixth, it is sixteen dollars and seventy-nine cents. Save twenty percent. So there you go. Everyone check that. They're going to re-release all the Final Fantasy stuff. That's just what they do, I guess. Yeah. Well, well, we'll see about seven if that ever comes out. Uh, they they had a, a port this is on the why PC. Didn't I'd they? almost well, just I'm talking about rather the, the, the have these re-releases. Then tr remake the entire game because now we'll just never see it. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Zone of the Enders, the second runner, uh, PS4 remaster. Um, they're they're calling it something different. They're calling it it's like uh, Anubis Zone Zone of the Enders, Mars, or something <laughs> like that. So, um, but uh, the important note being that it'll have VR support. So Zone of the Enders, Mechs VR support. Okay. Come on. We have Jehudi in 4K maybe. I, I played, I'm not I, a Zone of the Enders fucking, guy, so Jehudi is loved Zone of the Enders beyond back me. In the day. Um, but more importantly, for uh, uh, PlayStation VR, for Gus specifically, Gus, do you own PlayStation VR? I do. Good, because Nico Atsume is coming too. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't I love know Nico why Atsume, it is. But I can't imagine why you need a VR version. Why are you? Mad? Here, why are you so mad all the, about this? Just, why are you so mad? It's like it's only <laughs> why, why are they doing this? It's not even really a game. But don't get me wrong. I spent a lot of time playing. Why are they doing this? What if it. they're what if they're making it like more 3D and you can pet the kids? Well, imagine, like walk or, around the yard and yeah. see or the cats like, asleep. You get to sit in the yard and be surrounded by cats. I was already mad when the, I it's heard they were virtual, making a movie. Virtual cat cafe. And now they're making a VR version. Yeah. Well, the movie sounds sad. Oh, right, yeah. It sounds super weird and sad, uh, but regardless, that's coming, and I'm going to check it out just because it's Nico Atsume, and I want to see what they do. They didn't really say anything much about it. It was just like a screenshot it's coming that said VR Nico Atsume Boom. VR, and that was yeah. it. So, weird. Um, and then, let's see. Uh, those were my highlights from TGS this year. Do you guys, anything? I've been largely missing it. I've been uh, a yeah. little tied up, so I haven't kept up. I'm glad we were talking here. Yep. Get caught up on. Thanks for catching us up. Out. 
no problem. Like I said, it's not the, the, the biggest in terms of announcements that are really relevant for the West necessarily. I'm sure there were 8 billion uh, dancing arcade games that were uh, announced or shown, and those just aren't really on our radar. Uh, although, if I go to Japan and get to, to play dancing games in an arcade, that could change. That could change quick. Yeah, dude. That's Jehudi. So, that's Jehudi. Jehudi is cool looking. Yeah. That's what I was excited for. Jehudi looks like a Mech Mercy to me right now. Oh, yeah, kind of. I think it's the wind. I see that, yeah. Uh, so, next up in the news, Steam is changing its user reviews, or tweaking them. How? At least. Okay, so, there's been a thing going on, and it seems to be happening with increasing frequency. It's review bombing, where people will descend on the Steam reviews and leave, you know, hundreds or thousands of negative reviews to teach that developer a lesson. Sometimes it has to do with a feature in the game, like uh, Ark Survival Evolved got a lot of negative reviews when they released paid DLC before even leaving early access, uh, or the Fallout 4 paid mods stuff. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the game, and it's just gamers trying to teach developers a lesson, like, Ooh, you know, yeah. make their voices heard. So we saw this most recently with Firewatch after they uh, issued a, a DMCA against PewDiePie. Uh, before that, uh, we saw it with GTA V where they, a bunch of people were leaving negative reviews because Rockstar uh, DMCA'd uh, Open 4 yep. and people were not happy about that. So you get these events and Valve, they actually put out a, a really very insightful uh, well thought out uh, blog post where they were talking about how they, it, it's a tough thing to balance because you can't build an algorithm that knows whether these are fair bombs or unfair bombs. Right. So um, they're, they've been struggling to find a way to address that issue without censoring valid user reviews. Oh, and here we have an example of it, actually. Uh, yeah, right so this that's, right That's what here, I'm looking at on my screen as well. Uh, this, I believe, is specifically... What's this one? Though That's April, July. I don't know which game that, that might is. That might be like a GTA or something, but it allows you... To, so what they're showing now is a trend over time. So you can see when these spikes in negative reviews happen. And if you want to, you can then zoom into a certain period and see what it looked like over gotcha. that period and see reviews from that time. So you see that huge negative mm -hmm. spike, you could go into that and look at them and you could have this, have them all saying, oh, I can't believe they did this to Open 4. And you can decide if you give a shit about whether Open 4 was DMCA'd or not. I and, wonder, and I wonder. The, the, the great feature here, I think, is the fact that they call attention to it and you can see it's this high volume of negative reviews detected. And you can either exclude them from the reviews you read or only view them to see what was going on at that particular time. I wonder if the like it will still just show the overall and recent ratings because those I think are yes. what deter people the most is when you're like browsing through Steam and you're like oh that game has mixed reviews go you scroll right past it like I, I don't like I wouldn't be there's too many games to curate for me to dig into a game and see like what why is this game mixed like I just take it as fa at face value which is a problem but there's it's also a problem that Steam has too many fucking games on it so well, yeah, so this is this is more work um, yeah. on the part of people who are looking at reviews for their purchasing decisions, I think, because you do have to look at that and go, huh, what was this? Zoom in on it, read through that, then decide if you care, yeah. as opposed to the, the at-a-glance view of overall reviews are this, recent reviews are this. You know, they did find, however, that for the most part, the, like, once the event has completed, the reviews tend to revert. So eventually, that recent review score would revert to whatever it had been before. Sure. Um, although it would probably bring down the overall. So it's it's tricky on their part. They, they said they looked at things like uh, when there is a sudden spike in like like a sudden change or something like that happens. Um, you know, do you look at freezing reviews? Do you look at like, what other options can you take? But they, in the end, decided they didn't want to stop anyone from having their say, but they wanted to give people at least some way to decide if they wanted to pay any attention to those things. Yeah, so I think it, it's a good start. And even they said that they're going to It's probably have to refine it further to, yeah. to get it nailed down. And, and it's also not the first refinement they've made. Uh, the adding in the recent reviews isn't all that old of a feature. True. Mm -hmm. 
So they'll, I'm sure we'll continue to see uh, some updates and some changes to that as we uh, get further on into it. Yes. And then um, a final news thing. Um, well, actually, well, we're going to talk about that YouTube thing as well, which is kind of news, but I think there's a lot more to go into. So we're going to treat that as its own separate topic. So the final just news topic is, <sighs> so hardware hackers found um, this uh, ROM, it was called Flog, in the Nintendo Switch firmware. It turns out that this is um, a golf game from the NES. And so remember when that came out and everyone was saying, oh God, is this the start of virtual console? Is this like that them putting the, the blocks in place mm -hmm. for that? It turns out it's not. It is um, a tribute to Satoru Iwata who worked on this NES golf game. So I'm gonna get a little teary in this one, so please forgive me. I get teary every time I think about this because I'm a total wuss. But, um, Satoru Iwata, who passed away in 2015, uh, after they'd already started working on the Switch, but had it wasn't out yet, uh, they th he, this is a game that he worked on. He worked on this NES golf game, invented his own compression algorithm to fit all 18 holes of golf onto an NES cartridge, and uh, so they put this game, they put this NES golf game into the Switch firmware, like as a little secret little tribute. So he can like think of it as like watching over mm -hmm. every switch out there, um, which is really sweet and lovely. Uh, and it's also the game can only be accessed if the systems. So people are figuring out like how to do this, and it's really tricky. Uh, but the game can only be launched if your system hardware date um, is July 11th, which is the date that Iwata passed away. Um, and then. Um, and so if you have ever connected your Switch to the internet, you have to basically disconnect it, reset the entire thing, and then not connect to the internet, set the date to July 11th. Because if you connect to the internet, it resets the, the hardware time. Uh, then you detach the Joy-Cons and you have to execute this very specific gesture that Iwata used in uh, Nintendo Switch, uh, or, or in a Nintendo Direct presentation. One of those ones where he, just, like, he lifts his hands and does something like this. And uh, then theoretically, the game will auto launch. That's like the only way to launch it. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps. And it's also the success rate on it hasn't been super high, but there is now a, like there's a YouTube video where uh, dude like walks you through every step necessary to launch the game if you want to. Hmm. Uh, and the game apparently doesn't play all that well. Uh, it's like slightly updated for motion controls and that sort of thing. But uh, so it's more of a nice Easter egg than mm -hmm. uh, you'll functionally want to be playing this game probably, but it's still really lovely. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like that. I'm, I'm looking up uh, golf here, the, the NES golf game here on Wikipedia. I love the, uh, the Japanese pronunciation is Garofu. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just, um, now that that walkthrough is out, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look at. We'll put that in the link dump as well for anyone who wants to. Uh, Try if as long as yeah. you don't connect your switch to the internet. I have not played NES golf in probably like 30 years or something It's been a long time since I've uh, since I played that game. Well now you can it might be time to, to go revisit it um, All right, uh, and that about does it for the news. Do you guys want to move on? Yeah, I think it's about time, right? Sure. Is oh. it time? It is time. It's time uh, to say this uh, okay. <laughs> I was like, why should you keep asking of, about the time? <laughs> Glitch, please. It's brought to you by Movement Watches. Look, we all have Movement Watches. You want to show your watches off and be like, blah, blah, blah. Adam's not wearing yours right now, but you got one. It's lovely and sporty. Um, th this is the one that they sent me. I got the black and rose gold one. I wasn't sure if I was a rose gold lady, and I think now I am, I'm on the rose gold train. Uh, woo woo! It's yeah, right. I'm all sleek. I'm stylish, and I <laughs> people comment on it when I wear it. It's nice. Uh, movement was started by two broke college kids that wanted to wear stylish watches but couldn't afford them, so they started their own watch company. The watches start at ninety-five dollars at a department store. You'd be looking at four to five hundred bucks for an equivalent watch. Movement figured out that by selling online, they're able to cut out the middleman and the retail markup, so they provide the best possible price. They offer classic designs, quality construction, and styled minimalism. Over 1 million watches have been sold in over 160 countries. Get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to mvmt.com slash glitch. That's mvmt.com slash glitch. Now is the time to step up your watch game at mvmt.com slash glitch. Join the movement. Join the movement train. Woo woo. Wait, what's you gonna, you're going to be the conductor woo, for that train? Woo. Nice. <laughs> All right. I think it's about... 
time to talk about uh, YouTube's new gaming features. <laughs> I feel like that transition is our glitchiest yet, and I love it. Okay, so uh, this week, YouTube launched some new gaming features. They've been in uh, beta testing for a little while, actually, with uh, some uh, friends and family of Rooster Teeth, specifically uh, Game Attack, um, but they have now officially launched them for um, all gaming channels to use, and it's basically Twitch. Uh, so they launched bas basically their channel sponsorships, uh, and... There, uh, so you can support a, an individual channel for $4.99 a month, basically the, the same price as you would a Twitch sponsorship. Um, and the sponsorship gets you things like custom badges and emoji, uh, immunity from slow mode in chat. There are, uh, there's like special um, sponsor chat and all kinds of features that read basically like a Twitch feature list. Um, and they said yeah, in they the, get, like em emojis and badges. And yeah, and you you unlock more emoji and badges as you pass sponsorship milestones. So basically, the more sponsors you have, the more uh, crazy stuff that that you can uh, have for them. I guess like the the features and such. Um, and the reason they said they were doing this is they're looking for ways for gaming creators to make more money. Now, specifically, this addresses the needs of live streamers. Uh, this, I don't think the channel sponsorships and the emoji and everything don't necessarily do much good if you are a um, an edited Let's Player. Correct. Yeah. Um, but they, this is very clearly a move that they're trying to attract more people into the live streaming category um, of YouTube gaming. Um, but I find it interestingly, kind of interesting, honestly, that it does read like a like a Twitch feature list. Yeah. I would have expected. Uh, like it's all it's good to have. Like you know, honestly, I think that if there's there's nothing bad about having it. I know a lot a lot of people are criticizing it, saying that, uh, well, I could just go over to Twitch, and that's true. But this is now, I think, an attempt to one stem the bleeding. So if people are looking at like they could stay on YouTube where they're all losing ad revenue from these edited videos or they could just go over to Twitch. Um, this way they can say, hey, your viewer base is already here. Stay here and you get the same feature set uh, and try to you know keep uh, YouTube creators on YouTube because it does tend to reduce the reason to leave the platform. Right. Yeah. Um, even though it doesn't address things like ad revenue, which um, is, I think, uh, the the big issue currently for yeah. a lot of, like, gaming Let's Players. Yeah, I think they've got several problems that they're working on, you know, the ad revenue for edited Let's Plays, as well as, you know, trying to attract people to their live stream platform. And I know right now when we're recording, it's not, like, a prime streaming time. It's still the morning and whatnot, but I decided to do a quick side-by-side -side comparison. Yep. Uh, YouTube and Twitch. And uh, according to YouTube, the highest viewed PUBG stream at the time is PewDiePie, and it just says test. It's got a picture of Barbra Streisand. Uh, it says there's 16,000 people watching. Second highest is 1,100 people. Uh, you go over to Twitch, and there's several that are uh, over 10,000, and the highest being 14,000. Like, there's a lot more people on Twitch right now watching this, so I think they're trying to figure out how to get those people over to their platform. Yeah, and it's going to be really tricky, too, for anyone that they've already essentially lost to live streaming because Twitch's partnership contracts can be a pretty brutal. They, like, you can, a lot of people have signed away uh, their ability to stream on platforms that aren't Twitch. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, so uh, that's, um, if, it's not affiliate, but if you're a Twitch partner, then it, uh, you know, and it may de vary depending on the user, but uh, in the, the base contract, or at least it used to be, uh, it was that you wouldn't stream on other platforms, specifically on, say, YouTube. Hmm. So you could, um, let's say you, Adam, are a Twitch partner, uh, and you can't stream on an Adam Ellis YouTube channel. You could stream on The No, which we do, because that's not a personal channel, and right. that's not something that you, like, own or... Um, you know, it's it's not a direct competitor, right. but you couldn't stream on your own channel necessarily. I, I think, I think it's a, I think this is a good thing just because I don't think it's ever a bad thing that people are getting ways to support creators and the people that they like to watch. But I don't think that like this is gonna pull people like people that are already invested in the not just not just the creators that are invested in Twitch, but the viewers like. 
if you're on Twitch and you're you're subscribing to people, you're getting their emotes so you can use them across all of Twitch and things like that. And like I don't see people wanting to drop all that to go start on YouTube. I agree. I think that uh, at the moment this is more to try to stop users leaving YouTube. Yeah. Mm. Uh, because Twitch has done a really, really good job in the past several years of building a community that uh, one encourages things like, you know, financially supporting creators and like, you know, you're, you're sponsoring them, there's, there's tips and donations and all that, and they've built a really good culture of that. Whereas uh, YouTube, a lot of people <clears throat> expect that you go to YouTube and you watch stuff for free. Right, right. Um, and there isn't that, that, there isn't that culture of uh, financially supporting creators here, so I think YouTube is gonna have an uphill battle. Uh, I also think Twitch has done a good job of showing off, um, like, look how many people are watching stuff concurrently and, and uh, really driving that story. YouTube is operating at a completely different scale. Yeah, right. It's magnitudes larger, but people think of Twitch as, to some degree, being bigger because you see all these concurrent numbers, whereas you don't see the concurrent numbers on VOD on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Twitch is like the de facto live streaming platform. It is. So, it's, I mean, it also, it's also like, this is a good thing for people that decide that they want to do live streaming rather than like VOD content, but like the difference is like you stream when, you, when you're like a, a professional streaming stream for eight to 10 hours a day, whereas if you're making YouTube videos, you shoot for an hour, you edit for the rest of the day or something like that, but it's just a completely different workload and, yeah. and balance. Like you can't block shoot things and I don't know, it doesn't solve those kind of problems for people. No, it doesn't, but I imagine that what's going to happen is a lot of uh, the sort of mid-tier creators that are being hit the hardest by the adpocalypse are going to be more incentivized now to add live streaming to their content lineup. Yeah. And in the end, it's good for people who either want to stream or want to watch streams to have it's, competing platforms yeah. that uh, they can choose from. Right. Yeah. It should it should benefit everyone in the end if YouTube can figure it out and can get some of those people over. Well, because theoretically, and this is actually what disappoints me a little bit about uh, YouTube more or less just copy-pasting the feature set, is with YouTube's resources, I would have expected them to take it not just to the equivalent, but up a notch, mm. uh, whether that's uh, you can have one stream that's going across multiple channels that's easily handled on YouTube's side or something like that, mm -hmm. where they have, I mean, they have the resources of YouTube. This is a well, huge platform. It's got a huge engineering and tech team, and you would think that they would have the resources to, de to devote to developing new stuff. You think, uh, I would think that maybe they're just trying to reach a level of parity first. And then going to start step trying up. to step up a after that. Yeah. There are feature sets in the YouTube player that I do prefer over the Twitch player. Uh, like the multicam aspect is easier. Being able to record or go, or sorry, go back in time a little bit on YouTube is really great. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there are some advantages, but still overall, I mean, Twitch is the platform for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think um, I would like to see YouTube do well in this regard, but they're just going to have such a difficult time with the users, especially... Uh, the, the downside of them positioning this as a way for gaming creators to make more money when they're in the middle of losing a bunch of money from ads is that now a lot of the uh, YouTube uh, gaming viewers are seeing this as, oh, so you want us to pay, mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. want us to pick up the slack right. of paying creators. I could see that. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, it, it does sort of feed into the, the YouTube viewing culture of it's all free. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a different different perception. You go for different reasons, like you said. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be very curious to see if this uh, ends up having an impact on YouTube live streaming viewing. Mm -hmm. It's it, there. It will probably vary from channel to channel as well. I know I've uh, I've dropped in on a couple of the Game Attack live streams, and uh, they have a, just a such an engaged. Uh, audience and they were constant tips, constant new sponsorships coming in, and you could see them all in the in the activity feed, and it was really impressive to see. It felt like something I would have expected to see on Twitch, mm -hmm. but a lot of other channels that no one thinks to do that because that's just not what the YouTube audience is trained to do. Mm -hmm. They're trained to <laughs> tell me all about how much company they keep my mom <laughs> or my boobs. Uh, all right, so the, the, the real star 
of this episode of Glitch Please is Divinity Original Sin 2, which we all, we've been playing individually. We got together and played it a little bit as well. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about there. So let's do it. <laughs> Okay, so Divinity Original Sin 2. This is, for those who aren't aware, a role-playing video game. It's developed and self-published by Larian Studios. Right now it's available on PC uh, via Steam. It's the sequel um, to Divinity Original Sin, which came out in 2014. Uh, the game was released worldwide on uh, the 14th of September, so it was a couple of weeks ago. Wait, what week is it? No, it was released last, last week. week. God, I'm... I'm completely out of it right now. Uh, the game, uh, the game's plot takes place uh, centuries after the uh, the first Divinity Original Sin. So it's a time of wars, religious persecution, and Bishop Alexander the Innocent declares all sorcerers to be criminals, so a group of four sorcerers embark on a quest to defeat him. So um, something similar to the Lone Wolf Talent in Divinity Original Sin may allow smaller parties or even a single character. Um, See, players are able to choose their character stats, race, origin story at the start of the game. Uh, and you have really cool stuff in the character screen too. Like you can select tags that then uh, change some of the conversation options you have. Um, you can recruit up to three companions to assist or play with friends. The companions can become playable characters. So there we go there. Um, up to three other players uh, can compete or assist in multiplayer, but it's tricky. There's, it's competitive co-op. Uh, the player can manipulate the environment to their advantage as well with dialogue and quests differing depending on the character's backstory. Uh, things like uh, like race and class and the different tags you have uh, set to your character um, all have an impact. A skill crafting system allows players to mix and change their skills. A cover system is also featured and can be used in combat. The game also features a competitive multiplayer mode where players are divided into two different teams and fight against each other in an arena map. So that's just a, like a quick summary from the game's Wikipedia. We actually did a uh, know before you go on it that breaks out a whole bunch of the different features and modes uh, that I would recommend checking out. There's more gameplay in there as well, um, just to get a better idea of the overall feature set. But what it comes down to is, God damn, this game isn't like a pure, this is a thoroughbred of an RPG. Yeah, and I do want to clarify something real fast. So yes. it's not just exclusively competitive multiplayer. But uh, like in that arena mode that you, mm -hmm. you talked about, you can also play the campaign together in multiplayer, but it's not like the loot is sharded to each character. You still have like global loot that you have to figure out and divvy amongst your party. There's also a competitive co-op mode where you work together to get to the end of the game, but by the end of the game, only one of you will be like the god tier player. Like, uh, we haven't gotten that far. Yeah, then. you're yeah. you're actually like competing with the people you're playing with. To like be the be the the, the good guy. The, so you the, need the each other to get through the game, but only one of you can win it. This is like the most RPG game ever. There's so much shit in it, dude. It's almost overwhelming. So like it, it is. It sometimes is. It's I have, absolutely intimidating at first. So I would recommend like be patient and give it a little bit of time. And that's the problem I have a lot of times with open world games is I just feel overwhelmed. And I definitely get a lot of that with uh, with this game. The first, you know, level, the introduction tutorial, you know, is very guided. It's like a small area, but then, you know, something happens, and then you really like get into a bigger area, and then it's, I get like, oh shit, well, who am I going to talk to? And you know, the, 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 the tool tips are like, don't be a stranger. Talk to everyone. Like, I don't want to fucking talk to yeah. everyone. So like, that's that's the other thing is like, you don't know who to talk to. Right. <laughs> There's no markers. It doesn't have an exclamation point above people's heads. You just start talking to people and they're like, oh, dude, do you want to go find this fucking glove? And little do you know that you, you find this glove in a crocodile and this glove will let you teleport people to, to a location. Like, you can literally take your party member and drop them up on like an inaccessible ledge, or you can teleport a, 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 a chest that's like you could never get to, but now you can because you have this fucking glove that this random guy told you about. The game is so fucking good. Yeah, it's there's a lot going on. Oh my on. God. Yeah, so the... I, yeah. I, can't, I don't even feel like I want to look at all this because it's kind of spoilery, but we're, we're, we haven't even left the tutorial zone. I played last night on my own save for another three hours and I played a total of like maybe six hours in, in, in just Fort Joy which is like a small little tutorial area because there's so much shit to find dude mm -hmm. and so much little stories and stuff like that you wouldn't find otherwise. Mm -hmm. We we were walking around what, that cave last night. Did you find the blind lady? No! <laughs> And, and then you can also fuck with your party too. Like we were playing all of us together we were doing multiplayer and uh, you kept taking 
you kept taking all the NPCs and all the loot. I didn't take the NPC. I talked to one fucking guy. And then you claimed, and you kept <laughs> you kept hitting me also. So since that, I was, that was intentional. Since I was a rogue, I started sneaking and I pickpocketed you and I took yeah, your you keys. Yeah, you took my fucking buddy key. I don't even know what that's for. Give it back. <laughs> so I was like, I'll, I'll I'll show them so you can like you can really work against your party. You can also go the other way where uh, you can put something into another player's inventory, and this feeds into that sort of competitive multiplayer uh, aspect where you're all going through, but but say you've got something stolen and uh, a guard has stopped you and is talking to one of the characters, you can go ahead and put something stolen in their inventory if you want and they might get caught and end up getting attacked by all the guards as a result. And um, it's, it is very old school RPG. It doesn't hold your hand. No. It drops you into the game. It will give you tool tips to say, hey, talk to everybody, or maybe like try this thing, or you can now do this, but it doesn't tell you where to go. You're not sure what you're supposed to do to progress yeah. the story. You're like, at this point, you're like, I need to escape? Yeah. But you're some, not sure how to go about doing that, and there are a bunch of different ways. Some, some, of, the, some of the quests will give you a marker on the map. Like, like the one where he tells you to go kill crocodile things, uh, you can see a marker on the map, but other ones you just have journal entries and you're like I just talked to this dead guy who said if I freed his soul He would show me how to get into the dungeons and Go do go find that and like you find that but it's, it, it's so fucking well and a lot of the uh, This game is good for replayability. I think not just for like oh, I'll try a battle mage this time but also because depending on these tiny choices you make, it can really affect the flow. So, as an example, I was doing a quest yesterday. I met the blind lady. So I, I met a blind lady in a cave, and she said, my friend has been captured by this dude. And so I went and talked to the dude, and he said, someone stole my oranges, find out who, and I'll let him go. I know who stole the oranges. I know who stole the oranges, too. So I had to, because I'm playing, my main character that I'm playing is an elf, I had to leave her behind and take my secondary party to talk to the guy who stole the oranges, because otherwise she would just kill him. Gotcha. And so if I took her to talk to him, it would, I'd have to kill that guy, and then it would basically lock out mm -hmm. the quest. So left her behind, went and talked to the guy, resolved that, and then uh, then could return and talk to the dude, but then you're presented with yet another fork, which is, do you give up the thief? Do you not give up the thief? I chose to not give up the thief because I feel like I'm gonna need him later and I don't want this guy killing him. And because I wouldn't give him up, he and all of his friends, who most of whom are also shopkeepers, attacked me and I had to defeat like five of these different people in Fort Joy and now I have no one to shop with. Well, even like on, on a smaller scale as well, like you were talking about earlier, the tags are also another way that uh, offer replayability and iteration because depending on how you're tagged, you're presented with different dialogue options you know, in your encounters. So how did you build out your single player character? Uh, I, I, I did Soldier at first. I played that one very shortly and then I switched to Rogue. Okay. Uh, so, so Outlaw. So there's also uh, an additional detail in the character creation, which is there are a couple preset characters. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, I started there's, with one of those. So there's, there's, there's Beast, there's uh, Seville, there's um, Ifan. What's the difference there's... between Beast and Dwarf? Because they look the same. Ah, I'm glad you asked that because uh, Beast is a pre built character, which means he has a specific backstory. So oh. there will be dialogue options and quest options that only Beast can have. I thought they were just calling dwarf beasts. And I thought that no, was no, rude. no. Nope, that's his, that's his name. And so uh, he is a specific dwarf with a specific backstory. You'll have different VO, you'll have uh, different options. You may be locked out of some quests, but you will specifically get other quests as a result of uh, if you're him or if you're just another dwarf. The game is a lot of game. There's it's a lot, a lot of on. game. Like, you, I mean, it's like, there's so much going on. You can, uh, I discovered this last night, and we talked about this. You can pick up buckets and put them on your head as, yeah. and wear them as a helmet. I, I, thought, I, wear, I, I, I wear a bucket helmet. When I discovered that, I was like, okay, my whole team's getting buckets. And I found like four buckets, and we all walked around with buckets. Then I found a cool headdress. But like, there's so many like nooks and crannies in this game that you would never find unless you hovered your mouse over them. Like, we decided to walk into a random cave together. And we walked in this cave and tried to fight these frogs that just kept fucking us up. So we're like, all right, we're going to 
back off the frogs. And as we were leaving, I played a dwarf, and I was like, there's a little hole. And I clicked in the hole, and I was like, guys, come in the hole. And Gus was like, I cannot fit in the hole. I am too big. big. I'm like, oh. And so when I, I climbed up a ladder, it opened up a hatch next to Gus. And he's like, oh, we went down the, and we went down the hatch, and it opened up this whole other storyline. Like, this whole <laughs> game is like little storylines available to you. Yeah. Adam getting so and excited. It's so cool. And also in a weird, creepy uh, feature, elves can eat the flesh of oh, yeah, that's dead weird. people and then gain memories that that person had during their life. Right. So at the conclusion of like one quest or one interaction I had, someone said, uh, oh, here, I was saving this, but you take it. And it was a severed head or something. I ate the severed head, and it gave me a quest. Oh, right. There's so many decapitated heads. I guess I should feed them to my elf. But <laughs> <laughs> Your elf's hungry, Adam. <laughs> There's so much in this game. Do you know if you're, like, an undead? You found, like, Fane, right? Yeah. He, like, you can't heal them. Like, you have to give them poison. They drink poison to heal. Really? You have to find faces for them to wear. Otherwise, The deader the better. Uh, otherwise, people won't talk to them. Like, he can stand in poison and be healed. I mean, there's so much there's, shit. So ben, ben clarified that characters like Beast are called origin characters. And they have story paths tied, o- tied only to playing as them that won't show up for custom created characters. Well, should I, should I have played an origin character? Uh, no. I'm playing an origin character for my first playthrough, but I get the feeling there will be m- mm-hmm. many more. And so I'll probably play a custom character a second time around just to really yeah. see how it varies. Yeah, I started with a cus- with an origin character and then yeah. I just actually decided to go with custom instead. So yeah. See, I, I restarted my playthrough. Right now, I'm playing uh, I'm playing Seville and I any option that comes up that's a Seville specific option, I'm like that one. Yep, that one absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'm, you know, she I'm like, "Oh, all right. I've got some crazy grudge against lizards. I may have to leave the red prince behind. He's crazy." He's a fucking party, dick anyway. But he's a dick. I may have he's, to he I may have to leave him out. Shield, man. He's good. He can throw the shield. It's great. That and that's the other thing is combat's quite fun. Yeah. So it is, this is a turn-based combat game. Which is my jam. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, so it's a lot of fun. You see uh, each character's upcoming turn um, and like what order they're going to go in uh, at the top of the screen. And then you have, each character has action points. You can get equipment or abilities that will give you more action points. And then each move, uh, if you are either uh, traveling around the combat area or if you are uh, executing an attack or using an item or switching out your weapon or equipment, those all take action points. And so you have to try to balance movement with having enough left over to take a shot afterwards. Uh, If you have a, you know, you may need to make sure you're lined up and facing a specific direction if you want to execute an attack that, that, that throws a blast straight ahead like a Captain America shield. So there's a lot to the combat, but it's a lot of fun, too. Yeah. I, I feel like in the first game, I sort of... I, the game was incredibly fun, but I sort of screwed myself by playing a, a character that really only used a couple moves. My, my character essentially would charge into battle, make the enemies bleed, and he had leech, so whenever he's standing in blood, he gets more health. And I was basically invincible. Like, I could just, like, not take any damage and kill everything. I played Lone Wolf, so I didn't have any other characters. So I only did the same move to, like, every character. Mm. Uh, but I think, in th- in, and that's why specifically in this game, I was like, I'm going to play something I've never played. I play a summoner. And now, like, if, if there's fire, you can spawn a fire demon. If there's ice, you can spawn an ice demon. It's like all this cool, like, combinations <laughs> of shit. Also, though, uh, I was in one uh, Magic Combat last night. Someone cast ice. So anyone that was in that area was freezing. But also, anyone who walked across it <laughs> would slip uh, and fall. Uh, dude, I, 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 it was so stupid. <laughs> I hate ice so much. <laughs> and, and there's a, a lot of other environmental effects too. Like when uh, I first started playing the game, there was I saw a dead body with what looked like a staff by it, but there was fire everywhere and I couldn't get to it. I thought, oh, it'd be great if I could get there. And I found some water barrels were you know in the other room. I was like, I wonder if I could pick those up. And, yep, sure enough, you can pick them up and then drop them on the fire to put the fire out. Yep, I, like, oh, that's great. I made my mage character have rain so that I can put fucking fire out. Also, if you have like a ground attack move that like slams the ground with, with like with force, it will put out a fire in that path. Oh, really? Yeah. Like I did that with, uh, you know, the Red Prince, if you play him as a, a melee character, he has like a ground slam that will put out the, a cone worth of fire. Oh, but that's good to know. That game, the, the one complaint I have is that it feels a little bit clunky sometimes in, in combat the, and... I in, would agree. The pathing's not always the best. Well, you can't, you have to manually path around fire and shit, yeah. and I just want to walk around it. Um, I have attacked my, <laughs> I, I I attacked to... my party more than once on accident. Yeah, on accident. Or by accident. Um, 
Well, and, and a lot of times, I start off combat, and immediately, like, when you walk into a room, and it's like, oh, fuck, combat's happening, then they throw, like, fire that is just, like, the whole room, and, like, I can never get out of the... I feel like the whole combat, I'm just like, I'm just gonna stand in fire, because there's no point in trying to get out of it. Yeah, I remember when we uh, were playing together, we when we went into the cave, and we kept uh, getting our asses <laughs> by these giant frogs. Part of the problem is that we were accidentally fortifying the enemy, and <laughs> you know, you, if you, you by, by we she means her. I no, I fortified one. I did not fortify the second. Oh, that's right. You did the other. You made the red it prince was do the other one. Accident. You I tried to it. blame it on the AI. You, you tried to claim that it was, <laughs> it was the AI in the game. You <laughs> asshole. That was a funny lie to tell. Though, <laughs> to be honest, I like whispered it was. It was actually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was you. I was like, I, don't, I can't prove it right now, but I'm pretty sure it was you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can absolutely. You got to be. You. It needs you to be careful because if you click on the on the enemy, it's going to put it on the enemy instead. It's not going to ask you, are you sure you want to do that? Mm -hmm. It's not going to hold your hand. It's just going to fortify the frog. Mm -hmm. No one wants to fortify the frog. I've lit my character on fire so many times accidentally. I'm just trying to like burn a box, and when I'm done burning the box, I'll click on my other character to like lift uh, something yep, up, and yep. I'm like, oof. Oof. I'm like, stop, stop attacking. Have, or, or, uh, or like accidentally like, talking to someone. It's like, <sighs> let's get into this dialogue. I'm like, no, out of dialogue, done with dialogue. Please, God, fucking A. Have you tried playing it with the controller yet? No. The interface completely changes. Uh, so well, It's coming to console eventually, right? It is, yeah. It's, uh, I, th I don't think there's a release date for it yet, um, but the uh, it already has a, a full controller uh, scheme, hmm. and it's completely different. So you, for example, you're used to just hitting I to pull up the inventory, or L to pull up the journal, or M to pull up the map. There's a radial dial. Instead, you, you, you pull and hold a trigger, and it pulls up a radial dial, and then you select your option off the radial dial. It reminds me a little bit of how uh, Diablo 3 tried to do their okay. controller mm. implementation. I would say um, things that are a little bit annoying, you can't switch back and forth between keyboard and mouse or keyboard and mouse and controller. So if you... Oh, like if you, you can't have them both active at the same time? Right, so what I would have done, because I feel like moving around, walking, is I prefer with the controller, hmm. uh, because otherwise I feel like I'm just holding the mouse in front of them yeah. and guiding them. It's like a, like a you know, carrot on a stick uh, with the mouse, but with the controller, you're just sort of controlling where they go. Um, so I prefer that, but in combat... Oh, wait, really? Like in, you're just directly controlling characters? Yeah. Oh, what the fuck, man? That sounds way better. That sounds better. way better. Way better, right? Uh, and, but then in combat, uh, I like, I preferred the, the clicking around with the mouse just to say, like, you know, specifically move here. Sure. Do this, do this. And I would, like, as stupid as it sounds, I would probably just alternate between them if I could. But once I load into the game with the keyboard mouse, the controller doesn't work. I, if I load yeah, in with the man. controller, the keyboard mouse doesn't work. So you kind of have to pick one, not for a whole save game, just for that session. Yeah, I don't, But I, once you've loaded in, it doesn't alternate back and forth. Maybe they'll come out with some options to change how the movement works. I like it, but like, especially when you're just navigating the world, clicking to path is like, it's weird, especially when you're trying to go small distances and your character decides to do this like slow, jaunty walk instead of just doing a full speed. Like, I feel like moving around the world is a little Dude, bit slow. My slower. character should be sprinting at all times. Yes. At all times. Yeah. Even the sprint is slow. Yeah. Always be sprinting. Yeah. It always gets. be sprinting. The remember too, they they don't always take an intelligent path. Sometimes it's just the shortest path. When we were playing together, uh, I was on one side of a ship. You guys were on the other side of the ship, and so I just clicked to go over to you. And my character hopped down into the middle of a big fire, ran through the fire, oh, and yep. hopped up the other side. Like, hey, yeah. good thing we got that out of the way. Yeah, yeah, the pathing's not great. <laughs> uh, but also, I I really like. The, the sort of old schoolness of some of the character properties. So you get close to a fire and you suddenly get the, you're warm. Yeah. And yeah. it will tell you, like, you're like, you're all, oh, you're warm. If you're into a fire, you're burning. You, you could light an enemy on fire and then you'll be warm. <laughs> it's really you'll be, funny. You'll be warm and then it'll immediately go into burning. Yeah, it's uh, a little too Or much. you, if you are wading through the water because you're walking along the beach, you are now wet. Yep. Or if you're on fire and you get in the water, it'll say, wet, canceled, burning. Or, yeah. you know, it, like, you, it, it informs you of how your status effects are, are changing on the fly. And, like, what it is that's changing them. There are also, um, we haven't even really dug into this yet, but the, because I think this is going to take dozens and dozens and oh, dozens God. of hours to get a real feel for, but all of the different skills and abilities mm -hmm. you can do. Mm -hmm. So when we were playing, um, when I was playing on my own, 
there are dogs and cats around and they would go woof and murf and I can't talk murf. to them. But you, when we were playing together, have the ability to talk to animals. It's the if you if you're playing Divinity 2 and you don't have Pet Park, you or Pet Pal, you need to take Pet Pal. It's, there's there's it's, so much you learn. And then you killed a dog because of it. I didn't. You did kill a dog. No, we all had we all killed the dog because we all you, took part in it. Because you talked to him. Uh, listen, so First off, I, I also I also made a dog tell me he loved me. So like was it, that before or after you killed him? That was the different dog. Buddy, buddy is still well alive, and you have his key. I have his key. Um, but like, if you don't play with pet pet pal, there are literally just animals all over the world that have interactions that you could have that lead you to special things that you would never otherwise have, and they're all like. Everything in the game is voice acted, by the way, like everything. Even the dogs. And like, the and they all sort of sound like anim like the animals they're they're impersonating. Like, Buddy's like, "Oh, I'm a dog," and like shit like that. But like, I talked to Buddy, and he was like, "I'm really sad." I'm like, "Why are you sad, Buddy?" He's like, "I lost my my partner." I'm like, "That's terrible. You're not alone right now. Let me give you a pet." He's like, "I love you. <laughs> Let me give you this key," and that's why that key meant so much to me. You and asshole. now I've got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can also talk to like bad dogs and. You can try to calm him down. Last night, I was talking to a bad dog, and I had the... I, okay, first of all, can we just clarify that there are no bad dogs? Uh, there are dogs who love someone else. He's a, And he owe them a, their loyalty. He's a bad dog. Uh, I, offer, he, I had the option to use a little squishy red ball and distract him, but I uh, opted not to, and instead I murdered him because he had a crossbow on his back and he was shooting at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, that game is so good, dude. Like... There's Have so you much. talked to the crab on the beach yet? There's a, I didn't know you could talk to that. I thought that was just a critter. I no, well, I don't know. It's going wah ha ha, and I don't oh, have I don't have pet pal, and even I can understand it going wah ha ha. But <laughs> I can't I, I can't hear it saying anything else. So I was like, I need I was like, I need Adam. I need pet pal. I need there's to know what the crab is saying. Just a crab laughing on the beach. Wah -ha -ha. <laughs> Dude, there, there's a. I found a bale of hay, and it like gives you the option to interact with it, and it just goes. Did you expect to find a needle? And I was like, what is in this pail of hay? But like, I, can't, I can't do anything else with it. I, I really would recommend getting the pet pal. There's, uh, there's a, and this is, again, just in the opening area, there's the black cat that starts following you around. I would have just figured I now have a cat friend and this cat will follow me around. You talk to the cat and now we think that it used to be a human that somehow got turned into a cat. It also. And has amnesia. Beware. I played, the first time I played this game, when it was in early access, my friendly cat, I did not have Pet Pal, so I didn't talk to it, but it still followed me around. And then the guards decided they didn't like cats and they murdered it. And I quit the game and didn't play until full release. <laughs> so this time I was very careful. Also, your cat runs away in battle. Um, I went. Well, that's because it's a cat. What's it going to do? I don't know. Last Practice time it got angle. killed. So I, I, maybe they changed it because it upset me so much. But yeah, no, that game is fucking goddamn amazing. It upset you so much that you decided to kill all the dogs? No, I quit. Well, the dogs killed the cat. They had dogs. Oh, fuck, fuck. That's such a good <laughs> goddamn game. Like, my friends were talking. They were trying to f complete one quest. And they just couldn't figure out how to, how to complete it. And they decided to go back to this building that they had, they had like, seen but couldn't get into. And they saw, like, a little hole in the roof. And it was just it looked like it was just part of the scenery, but it was, like, a teeny, teeny, teeny hole. And he was able to teleport his friend into the building through that hole. And then his friend unlocked the door for him. And then, they went, and then it led to this whole other chain. Again. And, like, you never would have gone in there had you not been able to unlock the door or, or not been able teleport. to teleport in and unlock the door. Have you found Fight Club yet? Uh, no, I found Gambling Club and they cheated me and I killed them all. <laughs> so, I mean, this game, like, that's what I'm saying. This game is so full of, like, little stories that you may never find on your first playthrough. Great game. But it could take me, it could, like, I could see myself playing this game for, like, 600 hours and not playing anything else, so I have to pace myself. Yeah. So on the topic of replayability, have any of you messed with the GM mode that's also available to the oh, game? Oh, God, that, that's no, the thing I didn't want to talk about. No, we haven't even touched on the GM mode. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. I mean, Larian Studios is the, the developer, and they've been great about releasing information for it. If you go to their YouTube channel, they have all sorts of videos on how to do X, how to do Y. In uh, fact, they um, they have a tutorial on the um, on the DM mode that's um, that's by the um, oh Wizards god. Of the Coast? No, it's by uh, they do the Twitch show, the D and D show. Oh, uh, Critical Role. Critical Role. Yeah. It's by it's by Matt, Matt from Mercer. Critical Role. Yeah. So they he, like in... he goes through it and and right. is. Um, like teaches you about the the GM mode, which is super cool. They brought him in. They actually remade the entire uh, beginner edition Minds of Fandelver. That's the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and they brought Wizards of the Coast into play. Yeah. You can literally do anything in that game. So on top of the D of the GM or DM mode, there's another tool that's not in the game, 
It's Divinity Original Sin 2 Editor. And that will give you literally the tools that, that Larian used to make the game. And so you can take it a step further than what you can do in DM mode. And like, it completely opens up. You can script things. You can literally import other assets into the game and make like a sci-fi game if you want to. It's fucking insane. Uh, Adam Baird is working on some stuff and he, he hasn't actually played Divinity, but he's been playing it all week. <laughs> he's been playing the editor literally all week. But, playing but, the editor. But, <laughs> but, not, but not playing the game. Like, it seems crazy. Like. There's so much to this game, and on top of that, like once you're done with the game, playing it for a thousand hours, you can go ahead and hop into some insane campaigns that people have made. And like on top of that, it is like a a D and D like game for the computer that you could make campaigns for. Yeah, yeah the, the way I've been describing the game to people who are because this, you know, like trying to boil it down is very tough. So the way I've been describing it, just at the highest level, is you know, like D and D. It's the it's the D and D the video game. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, you're, you everything just rolls that way. And they've given you so much freedom and accounted for so much shit and so many systems on systems. I want to play more. Let's go have a meeting. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna start booking our, we're gonna start booking ourselves into meetings. Uh, yeah. Just to just to play this game. I think it's very very. It's good. so fucking good. All right. Uh, so that's uh, that's enough. It's, do we have any criticisms? Uh, Besides the, the movement? The clunkiness is, is clunky. Um, it, it really doesn't do the, like, because there are so many systems, it doesn't do the best job of, it doesn't really tutorialize much of anything, but it doesn't really do the best job of explaining certain things like um, where things are in your quest log. Like, it, it honestly, like, if you look at the quest log, it just looks like a journal from other games. How, how sometimes games log like, oh, this guy said something. And that's, that's what it is. That is the quest log. You don't have like, you need to go, it's not like bullet point to where it's like you need to go find the switch to open up the dungeon mm -hmm. or something like that. That's my biggest problem. Uh, but that's just something that takes getting used to because it's like a not hand-holdy game at all. Um, and also, I, I would like some indicator of... People that might give me quests. Yeah, I talked to a random dude in town who I just I was just like I'm looking for quests and he joined my party. Like I might have never talked to him otherwise. Uh, I'm probably gonna kick him out because he's not cool. Who's this dude? Uh, he has a weird name, but he's a he's a huntsman. He can. I don't think I've even found yeah. that. He has a crossbow. Yet. He shoots. He shoots pretty good. Oh wait, is this Ifan? Yes. Yeah, I like Ifan. I don't know if I like him. I like him because he is, uh, he's a mercenary and he's lone wolfy and uh, Seville is also kind of like mercenary at the moment and she's like not happy and they're both out for blood and it's pretty cool. I need to find, I want to get a, I want to get some female in my party. I need some, a womanly touch. There's an enchanter around um, near the entrance. Okay, there you go. There you go. All right, so the game is super awesome. We like it. We're yeah. going to be playing a whole bunch of it. Uh, so for the next, like, I don't know. It's a couple weeks to very least. When we uh, when we say like, hey, what you playing this week? It's probably going to be Divinity. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that is it for this episode of Glitch. Please, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you are a Rooster Teeth first member, you can also watch uh, New Game Plus our post show, and we'll be back next week with more Glitch. Please, if you are watching this, please give us a thumbs up. If you are listening to this uh, either on uh, on Google or on iTunes, uh, please leave us a review. Let people know that you like our podcast so that other people can find it and hopefully enjoy it as well and learn uh, of the love that is divinity. We'll Bye. see you next week. <laughs>